stand up and say, hey, real church has to be seen. Real church has to have the standards which are in the Bible. Not religious, but total commitment to Jesus Christ and His holiness. Praise God. Amen. And I'm going to welcome Suresh Ramakandran from the very beginning of this meeting to give his word tonight on the subject of Jezebel. Suresh, let's give Jesus the praise for Suresh. Praise the Lord. Today I'm going to speak a lot about Jezebel because I have to finish what I started. <laughs> so I really thank David for giving me almost uh, all of the time that we have today. And uh, if I want to talk about my books and all the stuff that I spoke about, I will see that after, after my teaching on Jezebel. But at this moment, I'm going to start the teaching on Jezebel. So, shall we pray? Yes. Father, we thank you for all what you have done hitherto. Amen. And Lord, we know that you have given us the victory which was wrought on the cross of Calvary. And today we are more than conquerors. Hallelujah. So Lord, in our third day of study, when we are going to study about Jezebel, may we remember the fact that we are not going to defeat Jezebel because Jezebel is a defeated foe already. We are going to proclaim our, our victory over Jezebel and remind the spirit of Jezebel that it is a defeated foe. And Lord, turn the church right side up so that the church can stand firm in the Lord on the word of God giving glory to God. Amen. And this night, Lord, I commit myself and all of us who are here and all the people who are listening to this uh, on video or DVD or audio, Lord, I pray that a special covering of God's protection be upon us. Amen. The blood of Jesus, which is the protection, is on us. Yes. And I thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yes. Two nights ago, I uh, spoke to you about Jezebel. And the meaning of the name Jezebel, loving kindness, a false sense of kindness and love within the church. And where is the prince? Another meaning to the name. Where is the prince? The element of pride. Then quite ironically, the element of humility, not exalted. You know, the false kind of humility. And then finally, husbandlessness or no husband not yielding to God's authority or God given authority now that's what we saw two nights ago and then yesterday I taught as to how one could allow the spirit of Jezebel to come into one's life home society or the church and the first one would be what Sin abounding. You know, when we entertain sin, when we don't repent even after God reminding us and telling us to repent, if we don't repent and if we tarry long enough in sin, sin then begins to reproduce. And sin begets more sin. And then when sin abounds, it's an avenue for Jezebel to come in. And then secondly I said, Things that we eliminated from our Christian lives, from our churches, from our homes and from our societies because God wanted them to be eliminated. When we entertain those things back into our lives like Ahab did when he brought in Baal or Baal which was one excluded from the nation of Israel, Jezebel would then come in. And also, thirdly I said, Ahab began to serve Baal before he worshipped Baal. So serving is quite contrary or quite different to worshipping. So if we begin to serve other gods or demons or objects that are worshipped by people, in picking those things up and putting them on the table, 
or allowing people to do that within our jurisdiction, what happens then is Jezebel begins to make way into our lives. And then finally I said that each object has its own worth. And if one gives more worth to that object, that is adoration. And that becomes worship. And that invites the spirit of Jezebel in. Now that's what we learned yesterday. Now today we are going to start as to how does Jezebel penetrate into our lives, our homes, our societies and our churches. Now we know how we open doors to Jezebel, okay? But you know, we know that you know the door is somewhere. And when somebody walks into the house, the person may go right into the lounge and take a seat. Or walk straight to the kitchen or to the bedroom. See what I mean? So just because we have opened the door, it doesn't mean that Jezebel is just going to come and invade. We know that Jezebel is a very tricky, subtle spirit. So Jezebel will not come advertising itself. It won't come saying, okay, thank you for opening the door for me. I'm here. I'm Jezebel. No. <laughs> Even so, because you open the door, we open the door quite ignorantly, don't we? So when we open the door, Jezebel is not going to tell us, I'm there. Jezebel is going to come in a very secretive manner. And Jezebel is well known to act secretly. And secret or secrecy is occultism. So Jezebel is the manifestation of occultism. So when we allow Jezebel to come in, we don't need witchcraft to come in, Freemasonry to come in, uh, divination to come in. Why? Because Jezebel in essence is all this. See what I mean? So when Jezebel comes, we don't know that Jezebel is there until the spirit pervades into the entire lives, entire homes, entire societies and entire churches once it comes. Okay? Now, I told you, was it yesterday? No. Day before yesterday I told you that in the satanic hierarchy, there are these ranks. After the evil trinity called Jezebel, Antichrist and death and hell. I told you how there are four levels of workings of demons down on earth. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And I told you that when these Spirits attack Christians or come into Christian homes or churches. The smallest demon would try to first come in. Only when the smallest demon fails to achieve the purpose of Satan. Would then come some other demon which is higher and authoritative and powerful than the ones that had come and gone. And that I also reminded day before yesterday. That Jesus said to the disciples. Hey you know what boys. These kinds of demons will not go without you fasting and praying. So Jesus himself showed the categorized uh, divisions of demons. Now the subtlety of Jezebel is therefore misunderstood by people who think wrongly that Jezebel would come into the church or come into the lives of people from the lowliest points. Jezebel will attack the weakest person. Now that's purely logical, okay? That's purely logical. Because even in warfare, the, we got to attack the weakest point of the enemy. Am I right? But do you know the difference between normal warfare and guerrilla warfare? Guerrillas or, or terrorists 
when they attack they don't wait till they get the vulnerable weakest point they would want to target from the top you see uh, uh, several years ago when osama bin laden's al qaeda attacked united states they did not go about bombing the small army camps of america or police stations or sheriff's office you know where they targeted the economic capital the twin towers in new york and the security capital the pentagon see what i mean now that is not the conventional warfare if you go back to the second world war or the first world war these allied forces did not go into berlin to fight they started in a corner they started in the belgian front and the french front and down from the italian front and they were paralyzing hitler's army in the weaker and vulnerable points okay now that's conventional warfare and the devil does do conventional warfare now that you must not forget the devil uses weak points uses vulnerable points and uses loopholes to come in and attack that is an established undeniable fact okay but we are talking about not demons we are talking about jezebel jezebel would never come the way demons come the jezebel comes from the top the attack of jezebel is not conventional warfare but guerrilla warfare and i told you i'm going to start by saying how jezebel would come now jezebel comes into an individual's life into homes of people into families into societies into churches now when jezebel comes you know jezebel comes because we opened the door right there is one little good thing about jezebel when that spirit comes it comes with a little gift you know when we when we come from sri lanka we usually bring some gifts to to friends right and this time i didn't bring any gifts because i had all those books with me <laughs> but usually when we are invited let's say when we are invited we usually go with a gift and jezebel knows that you know that's that's a good thing i think you know jezebel comes with a gift but quite unfortunately because jezebel is essentially evil the gift is also going to be evil now when you love somebody you will buy the stuff that you are going to give that somebody from an expensive store if you really love them if you really appreciate their invitation oh you know wow they invited me so let me not buy uh, from the uh, thrift shop or the pound shop let me go to uh, let me go to uh, you know some 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 expensive place and i'll i'll buy so jezebel also goes to the most capital important place of satan down on earth what's that important place babylon So Jezebel goes to Babylon does some shopping and brings some Babylonian stuff to the people. Yeah. Jezebel brings Babylonian stuff. Mark, would you uh, read for me please from 1 Kings chapter 16. You know, I stopped. Uh, if if you come here, I can see where I stopped. Right? <laughs> yeah, not that I'm not Yes, <laughs> uh, it's the same Bible. Praise God. So We read the uh, yeah we read here right Yeah that's right Now we read up to verse 32 which says and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal which he had built in Samaria Now read verse 33 And he had made a grove and he had did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him Thank you Here is something that many people miss out when they read this passage. Because of linguistic improficiency. 
It says and. Okay. Does that verse begin saying and? Which means it did not stop in verse 32. He erected the, 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 the places, the temples for Baal. And Baal was brought. But that's not where the full stop was put. And what did he do? He made a grove. What is that? What is that? I want to explain to you. <laughs> you know, Babylonian gods come in packs. They don't usually operate individually. Babylonian gods, they come in packs. So when Babylonian gods are brought into some country, they can't just erect a temple. They need a grove to put all those gods. Like a garden of varied trees of various species. So that term there shows that Ahab not only brought the formerly excluded Canaanite Baal back with Jezebel's Sidonian god Melkart which I explained yesterday that it is Baal Melkart, not just Baal, but also Jezebel brought in Babylonian gifts of many gods. So many that they could not fit in to one temple. So Ahab had to make a huge grove for all these idols to sit. Can you see that? And the chief of those gods was a female deity called Semiramis, who, is, who was actually Nimrod's wife. Now in my Babylonology, where I'm teaching about the three Babylons, I'm talking extensively about these things. Now Semiramis was changed to, to, to deceive people by the name Ashtaroth. And Ashtaroth, the, the, the actual idol of Ashtaroth, would be placed behind many poles that are called Asherah poles. So the chief goddess Ashtaroth with Asherah poles and all the rest of the demi, semi, hemi, demi, semi gods from Babylon had to be put in a grove. Okay? So, Baal was that which was excluded from Canaan when Joshua and them conquered Israel. That was brought back. Melkart was the Sidonian god which was coupled with Baal by Jezebel and was also brought in. And now in her hand, Jezebel brings a package of Babylonian gods headed by Ashtaroth. If you read, not now, but if you read First Kings 18, you will find when Elijah told Ahab to bring the prophets who ate at the table of Jezebel to Mount Carmel, Jezebel sent only the 400 prophets of Baal. But there were 450 prophets of Ashtaroth that she did not send. That's there in the Bible. I'm not reading from the Apocrypha. It's there in the Bible. Okay? And while I'm speaking, Mark, I would like you to turn to chapter 18 and try to locate that verse. Because I was not ready to read that. But I want to show to you that it is there in the Bible that Jezebel, in doing so, indicates to us that she knew only too well that these prophets of hers are going to be defeated. See what I mean? Why didn't she send 200 prophets of Baal and 200 prophets of Ashtaroth? Why did she send all the prophets of Baal and retain all the prophets of Ashtaroth? Now if you know that somebody is going to take away certain things and if you know it only too well, which ones would you allow them to take away? The ones that you don't necessarily want. Okay? The ones that you treat precious, you will keep. 
And Jezebel knew that Elijah was so powerful and Jezebel did not send the precious prophets of hers. The prophets, did you find the verse? Please Mark, come. Yeah, that's what? First Kings, uh, First Kings 18, 19 says, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, okay. and the prophets of the groves 400, which eat at Jezebel's mm -hmm. table. And then verse 22, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets mm -hmm. are 450 men. Okay. Right? <coughs> if, you, if you read, isn't there a place where it is? Uh. Okay, okay. <laughs> now if you read... They are, okay, I, I earlier on I said 400, and 400 prophets of Baal, but it was 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Ashtaroth. And Jezebel sent the 450 prophets of Baal and retained the 400 prophets of Ashtaroth. Because after Elijah won the victory, he went down to the valley and he smote the, all the prophets and there were only 450 prophets of Baal. Now in my study on Babylonology, I have, I'm explaining that these 450, 400 prophets of Ashtaroth became a secret society and they lived in, in, uh, in uh, Israel underground and they survived for centuries and when Constantine became a Christian, and they also began to mingle with the Christians. And when Boniface the Third was made the, the formal Pope in 609 AD, these ones actually coronated that Pope into papacy. And they gave him a name called Pontiff. Now if you don't know the etymology of pontiff, that is the same name. It's an Akkadian expression. It's an Akkadian term, although people wrongly think it's Latin. Right? Latin stole it from Akkadian. Akkadian pontiff was actually a priest of Nimrod and Semiramis and Tammuz in the book of Genesis. So it's Babylonian religion which had priests who were called pontiff. Right now, that is Babylonology, so let me not get into that. So, Jezebel retained the prophets who for her were precious and let the prophets of Baal be killed. Okay? So, Jezebel knows that anything from Babylon would be important. Now, I want to draw your attention to something else uh, a little earlier in the Old Testament. Joshua. And all the people now go into Jericho. Now you know the story, don't you? Jordan was flooding through a miracle. Jordan separated. These people crossed Jordan, okay? And then they walked around those humongous walls of Jericho, which actually were tilted towards the outside. Because in case the enemy would succeed in breaking the wall, it would collapse on the enemy. That was the strategy of the Jericho wall. And four carts, horse driven carts could go on the uh, wall. So that was how wide the wall was and it was tilted outside. But archaeology proves that it fell on the inside. Because the people of God, the Israelites, were walking around the walls for seven days and the, se and the seventh day they did seven times and the walls fell inside. Now that was a miraculous conquer. You know, they conquered Jericho miraculously. And there was a little town called Ai, spelt A-I. So <laughs> Joshua thought, hey, hang on a minute, man. Look at how we are victorious nowadays. You know, we don't even fight. We just walk around the walls and we get the victory. So you know what we'll do is we'll just send a few men to fight Ai because it's only a little town. So Joshua sent these people and these people went and they were whacked inside out. The people of Ai smote the Israelites very badly. These people came running back with their tails stuck behind their hind feet. Joshua was so disturbed and perturbed 
when I mean I'll cut a long story short it's explicated in the Bible in the book of Joshua turn to Joshua chapter 7 and keep it ready uh, Mark and then he says no 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 I want to know the secret you know I want to know the reason of our failure and finally they cast lots and all that kind of stuff then they found the culprit it was a man called Achan do you pronounce Achan? Achan yeah you know Achan uh, so Joshua said Achan boy come here what did you do man well he said verse 21 Mark if you can read verse 21 there if you can pull a chair and sit here, then you don't have to travel so much. No, no, after reading. <laughs> <laughs> when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian, uh, Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. I want to explain to you something. Thank you, Mark. You can sit somewhere here next to me. I want to tell you something. Usually, when God's people or anybody, when they fight against another nation, they are permitted, they are allowed to take spoils. That's not a big deal. Except when God categorically says, you shall not do that. As in the case of King Saul, when God said through Samuel, hey, now you go and smite the Amalekites, but you must not save anything, you must destroy everything. So here in this case, God did not tell anybody, Joshua or anybody, now after you destroying uh, Jericho, you shall not take spoils. He, he hadn't said that. So Achan taking the silver and all the other goodies wouldn't be a problem. And even if he did it without the knowledge of Joshua and hid it, it was a mere little theft. You know, I mean, it, it, that little theft is not so big to invite God's judgment on the whole nation. Whereas these people are now losing to a little town called Ai because of what Achan did. So obviously it is clear that it is not his theft or his love of money or anything that was the problem. But there was something Babylonian in it. Among the spoils that he took it was a, there was a Babylonian garment. And God, when God called Abraham, or when he was Abram, from Babylon, he said, you leave your nation, you leave your father's house. You know, that has a great uh, explanation. Abraham, I am going to produce a nation from you, and that nation will not have anything to do with Babylon. Now, that is why in Joshua, I think chapter 24 or somewhere, you know, when Joshua is now old and he's going to die, he calls the people and he says, he speaks, this happens in Shechem. You know, he says, hey people, you know what? Before I die, I give you a choice. Either you serve these modern gods that you have now seen in Canaan, or the gods that your forefathers worshipped on the other side of the river. And that river is not Jordan, as many scholars would erroneously interpret. That was Euphrates. So Joshua was give, giving these people a choice saying, either you worship these modern gods or worship that, those which were worshipped by Abram before he was called. So there too, Joshua was bringing a distinction between anything Babylonian and Israelite. Okay, And that's when Joshua said, but my, me and my household will serve the Lord. Right, that's the context. So here Ahab invites Jezebel and Baal, but Jezebel brings that gift, Babylonian. So when Jezebel comes into our lives, our churches, our societies and our homes, Jezebel will bring something of Babylon. And anything Babylon is Antichrist. Anything Babylon is going to leave us down here when the Lord comes to take the church up. And towards the end of this study, I'm going to give you, tell you the sole purpose of Jezebel. The spirit of Jezebel has a target. And it is for that one target the spirit is working. So now I told you that when we invite the spirit of Jezebel 
it comes with a gift and that would be anything babylon babylonian so for that you got to know to know what jezebel brings you got to know babylonology now i don't have time to go into that let's go to jezebel again okay now look at the little board here i told you that jezebel penetrates from the top okay now let's talk about the family now when jezebel is allowed to come into a family don't think that the little innocent juvenile child is going to be attacked or the person who doesn't have sufficient biblical knowledge why because they are attacked by demons already but now jezebel the big chap is coming and the big chap comes in a big way and the first person to be attacked is the father without the attack on the father jezebel never attacks the mother because maybe today society may say that you know this husband being the head and wife being the body is good for olden days now we need equal society and stuff but god never changes and so are his precepts okay just because jesus died on the cross he didn't say that the first and the third children are born by uh, the mother and the second and the fourth uh, are uh, born by the father it didn't happen till st- t- to date women give birth to babies right i mean even e- even in the feminist societies right <laughs> women give birth <laughs> to babies <laughs> quite unfortunately so the spirit of jezebel knows the biblical precepts only too well so that spirit attacks the head of the house head the father and when the father does not give in to jezebel then the spirit of jezebel goes to attack the mother while continuously trying to attack the father also the jezebel spirit does not leave the father alone because he succeeded in not letting the spirit of jezebel in and then go to the mother the spirit will go to the mother and then to the eldest child to the youngest right while still attacking these people now in your in, in your society in your in the families of your church now see mostly the men are the lazy people now they are active when it comes to house repairing gardening mending the machines but when it comes to meetings bible programs bible studies churches prayer even family prayer the fathers are tired have you seen that and so, so we would very happily say oh you know the culture is such that women are the you know we we have more women in our meetings than men Ex- excuse me those husbands if they are christians right if they are christians and if they don't turn up on a continuous basis not not you know when they had a problem and they couldn't come for a meeting or two but on a regular basis if the husbands find it unable to show up at meetings that they ought to show up just know that Jezebel is already there but the wives would say no i don't feel it you won't feel it why because if only the husband succeeded then Jezebel would have come to attack the wife so why didn't Jezebel come to attack the wife because Jezebel has succeeded in attacking the father and the whole household is chaotic so Jezebel needn't to worry to come at now now uh, can i can i take any one of you as an example for, for for me let's take you for an example right now don't get offended this is an example so if you are a wife and if your husband is attacked by Jezebel Jezebel does everything in your family through your husband you will have no problem praying going to church your problem is the problem in the family can you see that so many wives today are worried they are so spiritual they are wonderful they fast they pray they go to church they go for all the meetings and they they pray for their husbands to change for their children to be changed changed and they, you know and when you look at those ladies they are so wonderful and true they are not contaminated by Jezebel at all 
And if that is the case, they don't need to worry about the children to see whether they are under the attack. No, this works from up. So it's the head. Can you see that? Many people don't know this. Many people don't know this. And when the husband, the father figure, the head of the house, succeeds in not allowing Jezebel, then the spirit goes to attack the woman. Okay? And then if both of them, if the couple stand firm in resisting the spirit of Jezebel, the oldest child will start to play the fool. The oldest daughter will have an affair. See what I mean? The oldest son will be on drugs. How many godly parents do you know who are suffering from having ungodly children? And that's Jezebel. So they need to now know what has happened. But there is a good news embedded in this message. Unknowingly though, these parents have not allowed Jezebel to come into their lives. So that's a good point to start with in trying to deal with their children. See what I mean? And they need to get into spiritual warfare to de- redeem their children back. No advices, no counseling sessions can help. No psychological therapies can help. Spirit of Jezebel. And if you very closely, if you very closely examine, you will be surprised to learn that first the, the oldest child is the victim, not the youngest. Okay? So that's the family, okay? You understand, don't you? Now I can speak only on this for hours. But I need, uh, I need to finish this. So I'll, I'll let you do that. Even people who are watching over the television. I'll let you do the researches. Now what I'm giving, although it's uh, a lot of teaching, I think it's merely an outline. <laughs> you have to fill in the stuff. Then let's go to church. The Jezebel spirit attacks the senior pastor first. Okay? It's the senior pastor who needs to be careful of the spirit of Jezebel. And today many pastors are waiting for that feeble woman in the church to act like Jezebel. Of course other demons do that. But the pastor needs to be careful first. The pastor needs to learn, know and believe that there are demons. And believe that Jezebel spirit can attack him. And has to be very careful. And when the pastor succeeds, now this is another secret. Don't think that the Jezebel spirit is going to attack the associate pastor or the assistant pastor. The next victim is going to be the wife. Why? By attacking the wife, the pastor can be attacked. So, I believe pastors must pastor their wife before they pastor the church. My wife's pastor is myself. And if I can't be a good pastor to my wife, I can't be a good pastor to anybody else. Why? Because my wife knows my maladies. And I better behave in the presence of my wife because I am her pastor. And today, many pastors have rotten families. If you speak to the wives of these pastors, they would say, well, you know what? I don't even like to go to the church because he is so... I know him, don't I? But he is a wonderful, glorious pastor to people. And people are not attacked by the spirit of Jezebel. Why? Because the pastor is already. He's not a good pastor in the home. See what I mean? Then, failing, if the wife is also strong with the pastor, now on that note I must tell you, how many pastors do you know that the wives are crazy? You will say, I mean, if you want to know who these pastors are, you, you, you can say, well, that pastor is a nice chap. But the wife, you know, she's a little bit precarious. She doesn't come for meetings. She doesn't, you know, she's always busy. She's a nice lady, though. 
Can you say these things about many pastors? The wife is under attack. And then next, the pastor's eldest child, you know, and the youngest child. Only after Jezebel finishes with the pastor's family that the spirit would go to the associate pastor. See what I mean? And then the wife, family, and then the leadership, the elder. Okay, the elder's family. Now that is why Paul says to Timothy, Hey, an elder should have control over his household. I mean, if you really study the pastoral epistles, you know, if the elder's child messes up, he can't even be an elder. The child may be a corrupt one, but the father cannot be an elder. Have you seen that? Let me not get into New Testament here. Because we are not doing a New Testament pastoral uh, epistle study here. So that's how churches are attacked. And that is why you would find many churches where the leaders or the pastors are Freemasons. They are into witchcraft. They are into immorality. And the church remains good. Have you seen that? At least in some occasions. Some innocent believers, uncontaminated by Jezebel, uncontaminated by many sins, they are uncontaminated. But the churches that they go are led by people who are into spirits. Have you seen those? So if they can find a church which is run by a pure leadership, they can get out of their church and get into one. But what about those many innocent believers who really don't know where to go, where to turn, but because they need a church, they very painfully go into those churches and they go sad and come sad because they know that they are spiritual enough that they know and know and know that the leadership is into all these evils. But they can't do anything about it but pray. And they, or a handful of those people, can get together and pray and pray and pray. Nothing happens. Nothing can happen. Unless those people stop entertaining the spirit of Jezebel. But they would be looking to see Jezebel from among the juvenile believers. What a sad thing. What a sad thing. Right. So let's go to the society. Again, I don't need to elaborate on that. The leader of the society, perhaps the party leader, the governor, huh? the mayor. You know, these are the people now. Now, 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 now look at, look at Freemasonry. The members of those groups are always people from high society. Am I right? You talk about any secret society. Big people, lords, counts, and you know, they are the members. You will not find normal people, you know, shopkeepers, sales people, you know, sales representatives. These people being members, you know, maybe on rare occasions, but high societies are duped by Jezebel into this. And that's how the Jezebel spirit works in societies. Now let's talk about the individual. We spoke about the family. We spoke about the church. We spoke about the society. Now let's talk about an individual. As an individual, when we open up ourselves to Jezebel, the Jezebel spirit will start to attack from the top, which is the head, which is where the intellect of ourselves are. Intellectualism. Is brought by Jezebel. In other words, when Jezebel comes, Jezebel makes people think on the pretext of making people rational. Rationalism, making sense, intellectualism, scholasticism, all these things first come to the person when Jezebel comes. Okay. Strange isn't it? 
weird. Maybe you understand now as to what's going on. So if a young man like Mark, who has committed his life to the service of the Lord, and I heard this guy preach yesterday and day before yesterday, at the age of 20, he has that passion. He has that fire. And when this type of a chap gets him into a Bible college, normally what happens is, the chances are high for Jezebel to target this person. Because he's already a threat. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So the first thing Jezebel does is pleasing his brain. He would all of a sudden find himself enjoying the studies and think, wow, I never thought that's, that studying is so interesting. So you start to study and study and you start to analyze and analyze and analyze. And then you start to compare various analyses made by scholars. So Jesus says something, okay? Say, I am the way, the truth and the life. Now you, this young man, understood. I'm taking you as an example, okay Mark? So this man understood that right from the beginning of his day that he got saved, right? But now he is in this very prominent Bible college and now he wants to know what Rudolf Bultmann says about what Jesus said. Right. Now Rudolf Bultmann may explain that uh, in, a, in a weird way. Well, when Jesus said, I am the way, he actually meant that. And so, so, so Mark begins to say, well, I never thought it that way. Wow, that's wonderful. And then he is supposed to do an assignment on that passage where he has to compare various other scholars as to who opposed who and what opposed what. And finally, when he graduates from college to become a full-time minister, he is confused about Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Can you see that? And also magazines, when, when, when magazines come to your homes, free magazines sometimes come through the letterbox. And people may stand by the roadside and give you very attractive magazines called Awake, Plain Truth. You know, that and this. And they are so beautiful, you would read them and... And you know, if you read plain truth, you will see, wow, that's talking about science, that's talking about economy. H has anybody come across that magazine plain? You know, when you read that book, you know, you will never see anything wrong in that. Because it's talking about day-to-day -day life, what the world is, world is uh, about, economics, right, commercialism, science, and you know, all these good things. So what harm, you may say, would come in reading this? Why? Because already those magazines have begun to please your head. So, by the time of graduation, many people become intellectual geniuses, not surrendered Christians. See what I mean? Now, am I against Bible colleges? If that be the case, why am I a principal of a Bible college? Right. Am I against scholasticism? Why did I study those languages painfully? Why do I have these doctorates and stuff if I'm against academics? And don't you, don't you think that I don't like to use my brain? God has given us intellect. God has created us clever. So we need that. But we have to be very careful. When Jezebel comes, that's where he starts to work. Absolutely. And then after we become thinkers, we want everything to make sense. Church meetings must make sense. Anybody singing, anybody praising, anybody sharing a testimony should make sense. Make sense in what way? The way I think sense is. So I become the norm... I become the scale with which, or I become the canon with which things are measured and weighed. And if I don't, if I'm not pleased with something that's going on, I think it's weird. But in fact, I have become weird by entertaining my intellect to the devil. See what I mean? 
then downward so from the head once he 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 fails targeting the head now excuse me not when jezebel succeeds in placing the head if jezebel cannot win somebody by penetrating into the intellect now listen to this very carefully listen to this very carefully not when jezebel has taken over the head because once the head is taken over all the others don't matter you only become an intellectual <laughs> non christian right but if you fail on that if you if you allow the des jezebel to not penetrate to your intellect then he will attack your heart with passion emotions and feelings why because intellect didn't work give in so the heart and that's where loving kindness that we spoke about comes in so now you have no problem with the doctrines of the church that you go jezebel will tell you that this church doesn't love you enough the pastor is not having grace you know the way he stalks is so rude he breaks us he doesn't build us see what i mean now my question to you is hypothetically if i am your pastor what's the matter if i'm too strict and i offend you the church doesn't belong to me the church belongs to god he loves you he is kind to you and if i am not kind enough he will kick me out that's that, that's because it's your ch- uh, his church you don't have to necessarily seek after my kindness my love can you see why because you come to church and the church belongs to uh, god christ is your head but what happens is jezebel wants to now seek make the person seek passion compassion emotional satisfaction in the heart and then if and finally the leg if jezebel fails to penetrate the head and the heart then the feet the feet will lead this individual into wrong places jezebel will lead people into the wrong places so they'd rather be in a ball than in a meeting on friday night and that has so that has been very successful even in this hotel when i read that notice down there man i those people may be listening i don't care right i'm not scolding the, them i'm just saying how jezebel has penetrated into uh, the lives of uh, every sphere christmas day special is down there if you read on that notice board the christmas day program is you get up you have a wonderful continental breakfast and then you have a walk along this beautiful river whatever the river is just there the river tay and then you will uh, do a romantic walk among the shops that are closed on christmas day <laughs> right and then you'll come back to the hotel for a wonderful lunch followed by a time of rest and relaxation and after your rest and relaxation you come into a little christmas dance and mind you that's christmas santa claus is there now you must read it okay before you go you go downstairs and read it dev you must read it it's down there you have already read it thanks you will read it right santa claus is there and then after that party you have a wonderful dinner and then you retire into your bed so happily and i'm 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 putting stuff to it that's not how it's written but you can see that downstairs <laughs> but the title is special christmas program christ must christ the title contains christ but none of the programs talks about christ that's jezebel so where the people now want no there's no intellect involved in that 
right walking along the tay you are not you are not going to you are not going to analyze the water as to see how many particles of hydrogen are there in the water as opposed to the particles of oxygen that's not what you are going to do there now you are not going to uh, go walking along tay to see who loves me who is going to cuddle me where is that passion i am looking for it's only the leg can you see that can you see that people want to go you know jezebel leads people to go walk you know where they want to just be ha huh? and now you tell me if the more you learn about jezebel the more you know that jezebel has infected the whole society starting from an individual down to the church right and people are so oblivious to jezebel now i told you that i will share the 12 things that jezebel does after coming now we saw how jezebel comes right we saw how, how we can allow jezebel to come and i also explained how jezebel comes once invited from the top to the bottom so when jezebel comes what's going to happen what will jezebel do number 1 i already shared this yesterday so we are not going to spend much time uh, doing that bring back evils once eliminated didn't i talk about that yesterday the habits the 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 problems the sins the addictions that we had in the past the 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 the, the those evils that we eliminated once we became christians are slowly brought back in by jezebel so some homes some of the standards low standards that's what that that once they excluded would slowly come back and rob the high standards in that family and in many families people would say you know when i was a kid our household was much different there was family prayer there was you know hmm and now those are gone now this can also be 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 coupled with the second one new things in different labels because when the old standards are removed they have to be replaced by something so new things come but in different labels now that also i explained to you yesterday right now homosexuality is no longer a sin it used to be called sin it is called in the bible sin but now it is just the way some people are weird has gone god gone out of his mind creating people such awkward see what i mean divorce was unheard of in the past and now new things have come and marriages are now replaced with you know living li- yeah partnership i like what you said about uh, partners dave you said partners are what what did you say a partner is somebody you are in business with a partner is somebody you are in business with you don't sleep with a partner a sinner is someone you sleep with outside of marriage outside of marriage if you sleep with somebody that's a sinner not a partner but look how the new label calls it so nicely so that people are no longer hurt so new things like new age we are in a new age the new age thinking is brought by jezebel new translations biblical translations <laughs> right many many new translations are products of jezebel yeah, now my question to you is if you believe in a supreme almighty god don't expect his words to be simple if you want to understand his word you better grow yeah that's right amen absolutely see what i mean just because i now have a daughter a few months old i am not going to 
become simple for the next 20 years <laughs> but I'm going to expect that little one to grow in maturity for the next 20 years so that in 20 years we talk face to face on the same term in the same lingo. Yeah, yeah. But what happens is in time the translations tend to simplify the word of God to make people understand. Yeah, and, and what, what happens is, what, what should have happened today is, let's take, let this, since this is an English uh, message, when we talk about the English Bible, with all the modern translations English gave, all the English speaking countries now must understand the word of God so perfect and they should have grown mightily in the word of God as opposed to when they just had one or two translations. Am I correct? By 1611, they had only seven translations. And many of the former translations were not even available. Right? So the holiness level of English speaking nations should be now in the 21st century greater and mightier than the 17th century. Why? Because now you have umpteen translations. Now every common man can understand. That should have been the uh, growth level. But it's going the other way around. In the 17th century, there were more holy people and more committed people than in the 20th, 21st century. So there's something wrong. So Jezebel is involved in many of the biblical translations. Then new interpretations. Holy people, committed people, Polycarp. You know Polycarp who was, who was burnt on the stake at the age of 86. Didn't know higher criticism, lower criticism, hermeneutics, right? And, and uh, what else? Homiletics and... and Rhetorical criticism, uh, literary criticism, historical criticism. See what I mean? But those people were so committed. And today, there are so many people who know all these interpreting methods, but not committed. Now, why would these new things are so attractive to people. What does Jezebel do for these new things to be brought in? The Jezebel spirit makes people feel that old is boring. Yeah, that's right. So many people, when they go to churches, they find church services boring. When you pray for a long time, it's boring. When you read the word of God for a long time, it's boring. Not for a long time, even, you know, many people don't turn the Bible because it's boring. Godly preachers, when they preach, things become boring. Turn to Revelation 2 and be ready for the next one. So, the first two things, what Jezebel does is, bringing back the old evils that we once eliminated and bringing new, hitherto unknown, Things, evils, with very subtle, attractive labels. So we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful. The third thing Jezebel does is deceive people with prophecies. And I want you to read uh, Mark from Revelation chapter 2, starting from verse 18. And, and I want to tell you that this is very well explained in my second book, in, in, in the green book, right? Okay. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. That's fine. <laughs> you, will read, you will read the next section when I tell you to read. Thank you, Mark. So the church in Theatira 
is condemned because they have tolerated the woman Jezebel, which is a, a symbolic uh, inference to the false teachings that they were ent entertaining. And Jezebel is here mentioned as the one who calls herself a prophetess. Now prophets, prophets are called by God. Prophets are, you know, so holy that they communicate with God face to face. And Jezebel also comes with prophecies. And when Jezebel prophesies, the spirit prophesies correct things also. That's why we've got to be very careful. In many churches, in many places, there are those people who call themselves prophets and prophetesses who can just prophesy over you the things that can never would have been known by another person. And I like to give a warning to everybody who is listening to me. Don't! Don't believe all the prophecies. Mm -hmm. Even if they are correct. That's right. yep. Because I think somewhere in Matthew 7 or 25 or somewhere. I don't know. You know what I'm going to talk about. These people come to Jesus and they say. Oh Lord. You know when Jesus cast them into the uh, abyss. They say oh Lord. But it is in your name that we prophesied. It is in your name that we healed the sick. It is in your name that we did this and the other. You know, do you remember that verse? Somewhere, it's somewhere in the New Testament in Matthew. And Jesus says, I have never known you. So I'm asking you a question now. If those people did not utter true prophecies in the name of Jesus, could they tell Jesus that we prophesied in your name? Now that shows that these were true prophets. In, other, in, in, in a sense, they prophesied. In the name of Jesus. Correct prophecies. And the miracles they performed were true miracles. But they on the inside were corrupt and evil. So don't run behind the miracles. And don't run behind prophecies. Even if they are spot on. Many people come to me and say. Those prophecies were spot on. What do you say for that? I said, well, the Bible says that spot on prophecies can be uttered by Jezebel also. So you got to be very careful. Evil prophecies. Many people, many people lose their jobs, lose their families. Somebody would say, God says, hey, I'll tell you something. If I tell you a prophecy like this right now, if I tell you there is somebody in this room, you are thinking about what to do tomorrow. Hang on a minute. <laughs> and if you have 200 people, somebody is really suffering for, from a big debt. And you came to this meeting expecting the Lord to tell you something about your debt. Oh boy, I'll tell you, some people will be crying because that's exactly what happened in their lives. You don't need the Holy Spirit to say these things. Oh my son, I know what's in your heart. Hey, you don't need a prophet to tell that. We know God knows what's in our heart. Right? So be careful. Don't be emotionally caught up when the so-called emotional people Come to you with all that love and passion only to deceive you. So you will lose your job, lose your education, you lose your money, you lose many things because of false prophecies. False prophecies by definition do not mean prophecies that are false. Be careful, okay? False prophecies by definition don't mean prophecies that are false. False prophecies can be prophecies full of truth, but with a false motive, with an ulterior motive. So you've got to be very careful. Now, the next line. Um, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, 
has taught and seduced my servants to ah. commit fornication. Teachings. Teachings. Jezebel. Now I have written something here. Look. Jezebel seduces with teaching, not temptations. I'll tell you. Every one of us in this room have temptations in our own little ways. A young man like Mark must have kilos of sexual temptations. No, you say yes. Now that's not a prophecy. But if you say no, you have a biological problem there. I need to pray for you. Lord, didn't you make him a man? With, is he not a man with sexual tendencies? So, he is, he is somebody with some temptations in the sexual area. I, am, I, am I talking sense here? Money is a temptation to virtually everybody. Money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money which is the root of all evil. So temptation is not sin. Yielding into temptation is sin. So some people have temptation for sex, some people for money, some people for uh, say uh, power or something. I mean there are temptations. Now don't think that when you are tempted in your own little ways that Jezebel is working. That's the other small demons that are working, you know. And sometimes it may not even be demons. It's, it's merely your flesh, you know. If you saw an attractive girl going, you know, like in your country, who, who, who wear half and quarter and virtually nothing, you know, you don't need demons to come and tempt you, man. See what I mean? So, not all temp temptations are not brought by Jezebel. But teachings. So remember this. Jezebel seduces with teaching, not temptations. Teachings. Now, how does teachings come? How do teachings come? They don't necessarily need to come from an external source. It can originate from within you. Thoughts which can become teaching in your own brain can stop God's word being taught into you. Which then becomes unteachability. So, if somebody is unteachable when it comes to the word of God, that's the spirit of Jezebel working in the false way of self-taughtness. Some people would say, I don't need to hear any sermon from anybody. I, need to go, I don't need to go to church. I don't need somebody to pray for me. Why? Because I can stand on my own because I am okay. I know to think. I can read my Bible and find out. See? So these teachings, then, then also, teachings from external sources, attractive teachings. If you switch on to the God channel and TBN and all these Christian channels, I am in no, no way against these channels. Praise God for some of those programs. They bring millions to the Lord and they glorify God. But there are also some weird programs where the teachings are so attractive. Yes. Some people have attracted millions of people the way they teach. Profound you may say. Didactic you may say. Clarity you may say. Timing you may say. Verbal expressions you may say. Uh, the, 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 the attractive smartness you may say. You may say anything. To say that these teachings are superb. But most of them are Jezebelian teachings. Many, many churches have many, many, many scholars who teach very well. But they are Jezebelian in a sense. I know that. Because I am an expert in Jezebelology. And that's why I'm teaching this for you to know. How do we know the difference, Suresh, you may ask? 
that teachings must be founded on scripture not on experience not on scholastic researches there is absolutely nothing that i can teach that paul didn't know that peter didn't know because we are preaching from their sermons from what they taught we teach we expand them to you when i teach from romans corinthians thessalonians ephesians colossians philippians thessalonians timothy titus i am just re elucidating what paul taught what when i do teaching from the old testament i'm just teaching what moses taught what the prophets taught what what these old te- testament saints taught and the bible says very clearly that we should not put anything new to what's already written so i can never bring up something that is not substantiated with the bible for if i do i am of jezebelian origin but i may say it's my experience i may say it has brought thousands of people in it may i may say that this is the results are wonderful no the bible is the norm with which teaching is to be analyzed every teaching and preaching should be based on the word of god anything out of that outside that jezebel's teaching fifthly are we all right for time here fifthly jezebel brings in immorality you can read the 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 the, the following yeah so, uh, th- that last bit yeah. teaching to seduce teaching and seducing my servants to commit fornication uh-huh. and to eat things sacrificed to yeah. idols so immorality now there are now you know what immorality is now i don't need to explain immorality to you but there are two kinds of immorality that i want to show you jezebel will first make people active in their immorality that is though making those people do the immoral acts to make people get involved in extramarital premarital sex homosexuality polygamy and, and and you know all the immoralities you know them don't you right and people always talk about active immorality but there's something very secret and that's called the passive immorality yeah. what jezebel does is for those who would not fall into immorality jezebel will make them tolerate immorality so if i am a pastor and i have not fallen in to immorality jezebel will make me allow immorality to take place in the churches on the pretext of virtually anything many pastors many pastors allow unmarried couples in their churches yeah. and i have preached in many of those churches where i have seen the boy and the girl with their illegitimate baby sit like a husband wife and the child in the church and they are given communion and they are treated just as a normal family by the pastor who is not fallen into any morality and that pastor is so happy that he has not sinned but i'm telling you he is as equally guilty as those people because he has committed tolerate by tolerating passive immorality I am also a pastor of a church and I love these people who ignorantly fall into these sins and you know who who yield into sins 
they can come to church to change. They must come to church to change. Church is a place that changes people. People don't come to churches and change the churches. They don't come and say just because the society outside has accepted them, the churches must accept them. We love the sinner enough to let the sinner in. But we don't love the sin enough to allow the sin to be in that sinner. So before the sinner walks out the door, we want to make sure that the sin is removed from that sinner. So we hug the sinner and not the sin. And if I as a pastor allow these people to come too many times before I deal with the sins, by the time I start dealing with the sin, the sin which I told you earlier is reproductive, has contaminated many people in the church. And by the time I start dealing with this one sin, I will have a church contaminated with sin. And then if I talk something or if another pastor talks like this, then Jezebel who is having that false loving kindness will say, is this pastor kind enough? Would Jesus do what these people do? Hey, Jesus will find some rope or these wires and he'll start smiting these people, man. Just like he did in the temple. Praise God that Jesus is not in those churches in physical form. <clears throat> Now think about yourselves, my dear friends, those who are listening here and in the television. You may not be pastors, but what about your homes if you are the if you have the authority in your home, if you have, if you have in your homes, if you have the jurisdiction, if you tolerate immorality, you are immoral. Sorry. Better go and get involved in the same immorality. It's the same. Now I'm explaining that very clearly in my second book when I'm talking about Revelation 2, 18 and uh, 20. Okay? So, tolerating immorality is committing passive immorality. Jezebel, therefore, does not always make people to... Get involved in active immorality. Jezebel will try to. But he cannot succeed in every individual. And then he will go to this section. Tolerating. Okay, it's okay. You know, my friend is coming to for, for a weekend. My friend is coming for a weekend. And he's bringing his uh, girlfriend. And uh, actually, you know... Uh, they even have a little child, by the way. Uh, they are not married, but um, well, they are coming only for a weekend. So, I mean, I can't say no. So, they are going to come and spend some time. Uh, you know what? On Sunday, they are going to come to church also with me. Mm -hmm. Sounds very wonderful and shows you as a wonderful Christian. You'll get a pat on the shoulder and hats off. But what you are doing is... You are allowing uh, immoral people to come and stay, stay in your house for three days and two nights and commit sin in your house and you are just tolerating because on the pretext of taking them to church on Sunday. Okay, now I, I, am, I, am I telling you that these people must never come to your house? No, they can come, okay? They can come in the morning. They can have breakfast with you, lunch with you, dinner with you. But after dinner, you can't put them in a room. That's where the problem is. Can you understand me? So I am not saying if people are living together without marriage, you have to ostracize them. If I say that, then I am not a Christian. Invite them to your home. But then you may ask, but Suresh, how can we tell them you can't sleep in the same room? I'm asking you. That's your house. Your jurisdiction. Are you going to allow anybody and everybody to come there and dance a jig in your house? 
Can you do that in another person's house? So you would in all the love say to those people, look, we sat at the table and ate breakfast, lunch and dinner together. But you know what? We are Christians and according to us, I cannot allow you to sleep in the same room. And I am willing to come and sleep in the lounge and sacrifice my bedroom to one of you and I will give the visitor's room to another. So you show your Christian love by sacrificing your bedroom and sleeping on that couch. No, that's a good, good, good security point also to see whether anybody is coming out of their room and going into the other. Right? <laughs> so I'm teaching you strategies now. <laughs> then another example. Now you, you people have sky television. Some of those sky programs are pornographic. You don't have to buy pornographic. Some of them are normally pornographic. So you don't watch because you're Christians, aren't you? So you don't you know where is God channel, where is TBN, where is BBC, where, you know. But then you have these visitors coming, not immoral people, but friends. And they sometimes watch this. So you are saying, mm, what can I do? They are watching, but they are oh, they are going to spend only one night with us. So you are allowing your television to play pornography to satisfy your visitor and you are so holy, you are going and sleeping in your room without watching it and you are so satisfied that you didn't watch it. Praise God, I didn't go to the lounge until they finished, you say. But that's passive immorality. You know, back in Bellwood, Sri Lanka, in my college, we have 11 acres of land. You know, in our land, it's a very uh, big high tension uh, line going, you know, 33,000 volts. So we usually have the electricity board people come to do that work and that belongs to them. So we landowners cannot oppose them coming in and doing their work. I think you understand what I'm trying to say. But I don't allow them to smoke in my land. <laughs> And that, that was a big problem, Dave. It was a big problem. And when my students and my uh, uh, others went and told them, they made a big promise. So I went and said, hey, you know what? You are not allowed to smoke in my land, even, even though you are coming to do your work. You may be government people, but I'm not allowing you. You try do, doing anything, I said. I stopped it. Now I hire people, builders, who come and build in Sri Lanka, Many of the builders have a ciggy in their mouth and, you know, uh, stuff when they um, build. But I tell them, look, if you come to work for me, I won't allow you in my land to do these things. If you are willing, you come. If not, don't come. Why? Because I have jurisdiction over my land, over my house. So my friends or anybody can't come and cause disruption to my Christian standards on the pretext of our friendship. Why? I don't want Jezebel to follow them into my area. I want to keep Jezebel out. So active and passive adultery. The other one uh, Mark read was eating food offered to idols. Now that is actually Having association with anything that comes between God and us. An idol needn't be an object. I have another study on idols, which I don't have time to talk here. But an idol needn't merely be an idol resembling a deity of other faiths. But it, co it also could be anything which comes between God and I. So what... Jezebel does is, sixthly, show other things as more important than godly things. So, when people get up in the morning, I think, I believe as a Christian, we must start with God. Hi God, good morning God, how are you God? Thank you for giving me a good night, God. I mean, something, something with God. 
And if I am to open something to read, I think it should be the word of God, not those letters. Many people don't read their Bibles, but they wait till they are done with their mails, their junk mails, and you know, all the paper paperwork. And finally, if they have time, they'll go to the Bible. And many people will get up in the morning and do all their work. And if they, if they think that they are in a problem, then they'll start to pray. So prayer and the word of God are like two legs of a Christian. You got to pray and read the word for you to move forward in your Christian walk. And a prayerless Christian with a lot of word limps with one leg. And a person who, who uh, prays without reading the word also limps, limps with one leg. So you need prayer and reading of the word equally. Because 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray unceasingly. And Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 and 9 says that the, the, the word of the law, the Bible, should not depart from one's mouth. And also Hebrews 10.25 says that you, not, you should not cease going to church. And Jezebel has made many other things more important than these basic Christian requirements. How many people go to church now? Why do they not go? Because Sunday they'll have other important things to do. So important, pardon? Golf, yeah, of course. How important it is to play golf. And if they are so, if they have been so busy on Saturday, they are too tired to go to church on Sunday. Now try doing that on a Sunday. Try being so busy on Sunday and quit going work for work on Monday. Nobody would dare do that. And if there is an appointment in the council, they go. But church programs, church are all, you know, haphazardly taken and that's Jezebel. So, important things that are brought in between God and us. That's the teaching of Jezebel. Seventhly, when we go back to uh, First Kings, we would see that Jezebel slain Many, many prophets of God. Have you seen that? From 1 Kings 16 to 18, if you read, you'll see that when Jezebel came by marrying Ahab into Israel, the woman Jezebel began to slay the prophets of God. And in 1 Kings 18, there was a man called Obadiah who was a servant in the king's court who very secretly protected hundred of these prophets, hid them in two caves, fifty in each, and fed them with bread and water every day. So Jezebel was slaining the prophets. And in slaining the prophets, what Jezebel did was, she replaced them with false prophets, as I told you earlier, prophets of Baal and prophets of Ashtaroth. Now what does that tell you now? The spirit of Jezebel goes on slaying the servants of God. And today I'll tell you, I, I, I'm going to talk about the system. And I'm going to show you how corrupt is the system within the church. In many churches, it's no longer the Holy Spirit who appoints leaders. In Acts chapter 13, we see that when people were praying... The Holy Spirit told them to separate Barnabas and Saul, who later became Paul, for the work that I have called them. It was the Holy Spirit. But now, in many, many denominations, Pentecostal, Charismatic, Mainline, Episcopalian, whatever, there are committees to appoint church leadership. And there are annual general meetings where people vote in elders and deacons. 
and if you talk against these things you are seen as a sinner and a person who is against system do you know somebody who is against these systems god and yet it is god who said in first corinthians chapter 14 and the last verse let everything be done in decency and order my god is a god of decency and order so don't you anyone dare tell me that god doesn't know how systems work he originated systems he is the author of systems and my god is so systematized nobody nothing can match his system but jezebel the counterfeiter has brought in crooked systems that are so good in companies you, you you can't expect the holy spirit to appoint managers in banking institutions you know the holy spirit does not have time to appoint leaders in supermarkets he has other things to do so those are good there quorums you know quorums democracy democracy how many think that we should do this how many think we shouldn't do this okay eight people say we want to two people say we don't want to okay we'll do it that's good yeah. for anything else but not to the kingdom yeah. of god today what happens is some some places pastors are transferred every 5 years yeah. so it's no longer the holy spirit you know once upon a time the holy spirit stopped paul say and said you don't go there you come to macedonia once upon a time it was the holy spirit who told peter hey you know what peter you must not just confine yourselves to ministering among jews you must go to cornelius's house yeah. <laughs> once upon a time it was the holy spirit who dictated terms to people yeah. and now the holy spirit has to wait for 5 years before somebody is transferred to go with that somebody to a place b to continue the ministry can you see that that's jezebel slaying the prophets if mark is doing a ministry in place x he has toiled and started a church and he is pastoring that that church and if in 5 years i the leader or the leadership committee transfer him from that place from place x to y i am slaying the prophet of place x and putting him in place y yeah. because he is not going to be effective in place y because he has to start all over again and these people uh, who had this wonderful leader in place x lost him so how can jezebel slay prophets by transferring ministers of god from one place to the, the other am i against transferring no if the holy spirit wants to transfer let him say and let him do that amen then appointment of elders deacons you know even in acts chapter 6 when the apostles told these people to choose seven men that was they were the deacons to do the tables you may think that it was something that the holy spirit wanted to do but i'm going to prove to you that it is not the apostles should have appointed the deacons the holy spirit didn't tell the apostles now you must listen to this very carefully the holy spirit did not tell the apostles to tell the people to appoint some de deacons the apostles did that now you may ask so so they are you saying it's wrong i'm saying yes it's wrong the, the apostles did that hey you read acts and you'll see paul and peter were fighting peter the apostle had problems with uncircumcised people and paul the apostle came and confronted peter the apostle under the leadership of james the apostle the apostles in their early days had quandaries they were also learning and that is why when the apostles were there the holy spirit came and told them to separate barnabas and saul in acts chapter 13 if holy spirit could have said what to do in acts chapter 6 13 
Don't you think that he could have done that in Acts chapter 6 if he needed to? And God proved that their choice was wrong. How? God said, Philip is not to be a deacon, man. He is an evangelist. So he promoted him. God promoted Philip to be an evangelist. Stephen, hey, why do you use Stephen for the tables? He is going to be the first martyr, the Holy Spirit decided. And Stephen was martyred. But there was a culprit, a proselyte called Nicholas. Nicholas was one of the seven deacons who were chosen. And that fellow became a heretic and through the Jezebel's teaching in the former previous page, he started something called the Nicolaitan theology. About that too I am talking in my book. <sighs> Suresh, you are turning everything upside down. No, 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 I am just telling you the truth. Yeah, you are welcome to tell me if I am wrong. Did the Holy, the Holy Spirit tell those apostles to ask the people to appoint the deacons? No, they did. And the Holy Spirit in the subsequent uh, chapters proved that the apostles were wrong in letting the people do, in the, do the choice. But how they did them, that was a very nice thing. You know, they said, you know, get us people who are spirit filled, who are full of wisdom, you know, all that. Things are, that is how things are happening in today's churches also. They appoint pastors who are very well trained and educated with a nice degree from a reputed institution. <laughs> have been working under a reputed so-called wonderful chap for so many years. Who have proven to be so uh, good in their teachings and uh, stuff. I think Dave you need to. Somebody else. Okay. But what I am saying is. Today in many churches, in many Christian institutions, the Holy Spirit can't decide. Mount Carmel Theological College in Sri Lanka, where I am the principal. Do you know who appointed me as the principal? The Holy Spirit. Amen. Until the Holy Spirit removes me, no demon from hell, no man from earth, no angel from heaven can take me down. No committees. No <laughs> groups, no votes will bring another principle in until, unless the Holy Spirit wants it. But look at many of the Bible colleges. How pri who become principals? Who become professors? Who become lecturers? Who become registrars? You look at the churches. Who become pastors? Who become associate ministers? Who become elders? Who become deacons? In many churches, elders run the show. The pastor is a puppet. Elders decide how much this chap needs to uh, receive. When God is the provider, when God has the prerogative, the prerogative is stolen from God by the elders to decide how much are we going to give. Am I right, Dave? Oh, yeah. Very much so. Who else is doing this? Jezebel, slaining the prophets. And what happens is, Many God-fearing ministers become frustrated. I have personally, in my research, I have personally spoken to many pastors who have been serving in some places. And you know, it takes about five years for you to really get used to the people and you really start doing something and you are transferred. And you know these frustrations, frustrations, frustrations. Some people even try to commit suicide. You don't have to necessarily slay the prophets by killing them. You know, the prophet in that man is killed. So he's just a moving prophet. He's just a moving puppet. Replacing with false prophets. So, you may have that passion. You may have that anointing. You may have that calling to do that ministry. But you are removed because you don't have the degree and somebody with the degree is put there but that person has not got the calling, the anointing, the passion so he is a false prophet. Many false principles are principles of theological colleges and Bible colleges. Many false ministers are ministering in churches. Many false elders are elders in many churches. Can you see how this... I mean, do you agree with me or not? Yes, Praise God. 
If you don't agree with me, you are disagreeing with the word. Suresh has no problem because, you know, I, I'm not going to be affected by any of these quorums, AGMs. Annual general meeting in the church. Yeah. They even call it business meeting. Yeah. So that's Jezebel. Slaining prophets and replacing. Now also there is another way of slaining prophets. Removing them from the ministry through various means. By letting them fall in immorality. Many, many, many countries now are seeing many pastors fall into adultery. And then they are out of the ministry. That's slaining the prophets. That's Jezebel doing that work. And I tell those pastors, I tell them, use your brain. You know that I never travel anywhere without my wife. Right? Of course, I love mercy enough to take her with me. But also it gives me the protection that I need from women who come after me. Not too long ago I was in Switzerland. Two 16 year olds were after me in a big way. Even after knowing that my wife is there with me, they even came and told my wife, can you go to your room? We need to spend time with your husband. That's the kind of Jezebelian attacks I face. I am a Sri Lankan. Where those days, and now, now we are becoming Western. Those days, <coughs> I'm going to be open because I'm talking about Jezebel here. I'm going to be open, right? I come from a country where uh, 10 years ago, until 10 or 15 years ago, girls were wearing clothes which would cover them fully. Yeah. And lo and behold, we came to England. And then we began to travel all over Europe and America preaching. And one day when I was in uh, Switzerland again, we were waiting uh, in that summer for the boat to come. I just turned to see these women naked. Oh yeah, you want to go to Switzerland? <laughs> no, oh, thank you. Come <laughs> on. And you, you, I'll tell you something. That was the first time I saw Naked women live. <laughs> Sri Lanka. I never see that in Sri Lanka. My eyes got locked. Yeah. Not necessarily because of temptations also. But because this is something that we don't see in Sri Lanka. I was like, huh. You know what Mercy did? She said, where are you looking? Look at the boat. You know, we were waiting for the boat. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you that I saw these naked women didn't bother me. But imagine if mercy was not there, I would have looked and looked and looked and my minister in me would have gone down and down and down and the man in me would have gone up and up and up and all of a sudden I would have become Suresh the man, not Suresh the minister. All the holiness would have gone huh? and all the human nature would have come. And I would have want to see close up, which you could do. You, I could have walked and all of a sudden on that same night I would have ended up in the brothel. I would have. That is happening to many pastors from my country and without since we are recording without any names mentioning Dave and friends when we were driving back from Inverness or when we were near uh, uh, Loch Ness the call I received from Switzerland was pertaining to a minister from Sri Lanka who was who had fallen just two, uh, five days ago. Jezebel slaining prophets. One of the ways in which we can escape that is to keep pastors. If you are watching on the television, take your wives when you are going on these trips. 
Because Paul says, if you think you are standing, be careful lest you fall. Then money. In money matters. Many pastors from poor countries like Sri Lanka and India are quitting the ministry and going in search of jobs in other countries. Because of financial poverty. Slaining the prophets. You know, not only immorality, financial problems, other difficulties, depressions, many, many, many things, schemes are used by Jezebel to eliminate godly people from serving the Lord. See what I mean? And replace them with false prophets. One of the other ways of slaining prophets is assassinating one's character through words. You know, many people are now assassinating the characters of ministers without knowing, without knowing their hearts. Some churches which are struggling to keep to the word are spoken ill by established churches slaining the prophets Jezebel is actively involved in dethroning the prophets of God eighth one causing fear to the faithful you know in first kings chapter 18 Elijah did what he did on Mount Carmel. And after all those things, he goes and he rests. And what happens in 1 Kings chapter 19? Could you read that for me, please? Uh, Mark, if you can. No, it's okay. Let the camera be on. And then, yeah. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose, and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. Hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Elijah was the star of the happenings on that day in First Kings chapter 18. Elijah did what no other man that I know of did on Mount Carmel. You know the story, don't you? If you read 1 Kings chapter 18. And that story was so appealing and influencing that I named my ministry Mount Carmel Ministry. On Mount Carmel, Elijah, sl he slew the prophets after God's fire fell and burnt up Elijah's sacrifice. And after that glorious day, he goes to retire. And what happens is Jezebel, the woman, sends a little note to Elijah saying, By tomorrow, I am going to do to you what you did to my prophets. And she swears by her gods. Now Elijah knows only too well that her gods are already defeated. And he knows that he was the victorious one by now. But Jezebel's letter caused fear to Elijah and he began to run for his life all the way down to Beersheba along with his servant. That servant was not Elisha by the way. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Jezebel is causing fear in many people. In many godly prophets. In many godly Christians. Okay? Do you know how and when? When they are tired and alone. How? Through a document. Through papers. Through letters. Through bills. Through notices. Through lawyers details. Through paperwork. And I'll explain this tired and alone thing. Elijah... Before he came down to uh, Israel on the, uh, in chapter 18 of 1 Kings, 
He was up between Sidon and Tyre. He was in a pale cause, place called Sharifat. Sharifat. From there he started to travel southward. And he came to Jezreel and then he did what he did on Mount Carmel. So he, came, he traveled down to Israel. He met Ahab. Told Ahab to bring the prophets to Mount Carmel. Climbed Mount Carmel. And waited all night there for um, these people to come the next morning. And when the next morning all these prophets came. When they were given the first chance to offer the sacrifices to Baal. Elijah was not seated or rest. He was not seated resting. He was causing. Um, he was humiliating those prophets. If you read First, eight, first Kings eighteen, he was so busy. And once they, those prophets failed, he built. Re, he built an altar there. And afterwards, he uh, offered the sacrifice. And he came down after God uh, accepted the sacrifice to valley. A valley called Kishon. And he slew the prophets of Baal, 450 of them. Then he climbed back to Mount Carmel when God told him that it's going to rain again because for three and a half years it didn't rain. And God told, so after God told Elijah what God told, Elijah came down from Mount Carmel and ran 12 miles non-stop to Jezreel before Ahab's uh, chariot could come and afterwards he told Ahab whatever he told and then traveled northward to where he wanted to rest. Imagine how tired Elijah would have been. It doesn't matter how many miracles he saw when you are really tired. You are vulnerable aren't you? And Jezebel used that opportunity to send that little note to say that I am going to kill you tomorrow. So psychologically, although tomorrow I'll be getting strength and I'll be rested up, when I'm tired, I won't pre-imagine that rest. For example, if you had just eaten a heavy meal, if somebody asks you, what do you like for lunch tomorrow? You would say, anything. Because you are full up now. And the next day when you are hungry, then you will regret, you will say, you will think, I should have told them I need this. So Elijah was too tired to think soberly. Plus, he didn't have anybody to talk to. The servant he had was, an, was not a good one because his name is also not mentioned there. That's why he left him in Beersheba. Now if you read later, you'll see. Elijah goes, after dismissing his servant, he travels and then he finds a little cave and he sleeps. What happens is an angel of God comes and wakes Elijah up and feeds him with food. After eating, he goes back to sleep. The angel doesn't bother him. And after he slept a second time, the angel wakes him up again and says, now eat again. And now you have to walk for 40 days. Right? So, in, so God very explicitly shows there that Elijah needed the rest. And once he traveled for 40 days, the first thing he does is, he meets this man called Elisha, on who he throws the mantle and calls him to become his follower. And you know, that Elisha did perform exploits two times than Elijah. But for 10 years, that is the time Elisha spent with Elijah, Elisha did not do any ministry. Elijah chose Elisha to become his servant. And Elisha became the servant of Elijah. And for 10 years, he did not do any ministry but assisting assisting Elijah I have a whole different study in, on this and that is to show that Elijah needed somebody who could throw words of encouragement who could throw words of daringness to Elijah when such notes come Jezebel 
gr- g- gets hold of those moments when you are tired and you are alone to cause fear to you there are three kinds of fear phobia paranoia and dahlia phobia is a psychological fear which can be treated through psychotherapy and perhaps through psychopharmacotherapy you get acrophobia agoraphobia uh, claustrophobia necrophobia you know oxlophobia you know fear of crowd fear of heights fear of darkness fear of death you know all these phobias then you have a, 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 a little dangerous fear called paranoia paranoia you know people say i'm paranoid they are all okay they can be dealt with somehow but there is this thing called the spiritual fear which in hebrew is called yahe and in greek is called dahlia and if you read second timothy 1:7 there the bible says god has not given to us the pneumata dahlia the spirit of fear daily of fear not phobia or paranoia so if you have fear of height don't think that it's a spirit <laughs> if you're claustrophobic in the lift don't think that you know um, you, you you are having the spirit of fear see what i mean right it's the daily the spiritual fear and the the hebrew equivalent is yahe in the book of genesis when adam and eve fell when god came and asked them where are you adam says in chapter 3 i think verse 10 or somewhere we were naked and we were afraid not ashamed we were afraid and we hid ourselves so fear was the first consequence of sin in genesis and that fear is dahlia or yahe in hebrew the spiritual fear and if you read revelation 21:8 can you run to revelation 21:8 to see who ends up in hell what's that did you find out ah the fearful come up rise up and come <laughs> <laughs> but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and who excuse me the leader of this gang is the one who has fear fearful are mentioned the first but look who they are compared to who they are going to be with are you read it again the fearful the and then unbelieving so fearful is compared to the unbelieving the abominable aha uh-huh. murderers uh-huh. and whoremongers uh-huh. and sorcerers wow. and idolaters uh-huh. and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death <laughs> Fear began in Genesis and fear ends in Revelation. Fear began subsequent to Adam's and Eve's uh, di- disobedience and ends up in the lake of fire. And during the trip that the fear has taken from Genesis to Revelation, it is coming to everybody's life including yours, mine and yours. and that is caused by the spirit of jezebel the spiritual fear now what is the spiritual fear as opposed to phobias and paranoias spiritual fear is uncertainty of your christianity spiritual fear is the uncertainty of your christianity you know jezebel causes confusion in your christianity cause you to think does god truly love me this did he really mean what he said in the word does god love me is jesus's blood still powerful Did I really receive his forgiveness when I became a Christian? So what are we talking about here? Doubt. 
So, dailya, spiritual fear, is a form of doubt. Doubt means unbelief. Unbelief means you are an unbeliever. That's the chain that happens by Jezebel causing us to fear. When we are tired and when we are alone. There are so many Christians in churches who are alone because the churches are wrong. If you don't have a church where you feel you are part of, you are in it. In other words, you know, you can never be in a church. You know that. Because you are the church. So you must be in a church where you feel you are the church. Many people feel that they are visiting the, their churches. And when you are in a church, and if you don't feel you are the church, you would want them to come and visit you. You want them to come and pray for you. You want them to cuddle you. Do, you want them to do everything for you. But when you are the church, you don't worry about those things. Because you become a giver than a receiver. And the Bible says it's good to, to give than to receive. So you go to church not to receive. You go to church to give because you are the church. And there are so many people who go to church to receive. And there are so many preachers who pray, receive, 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 receive as though it's a market. And if you go to a church which talks about give and give and give, you think they are wrong because you have heard so many churches and so many people talk about receiving. You don't want to give. So, Jezebel is actively working through this fear. That's eight. I have four more to go. I think I can finish. <laughs> oh, this is very interesting. I think you are very tired, aren't you? <laughs> now, those people can pause, have a cup of tea and come back and play. But poor things, you, I'm sorry for you. But more than you, I'm sorry for me. <laughs> because you are just sitting there enjoying and I am screaming and yelling and preaching. But I'm not going to stop till I'm done. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 21. The other thing that Jezebel does is to make people act. Make people act. I'm going to say a lot of things in this. I'll tell you. Come on up. Come on up. Read. From the beginning now you read. Yeah, you read. When I stop, I'll, 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 I'll come up. I want to say <laughs> <laughs> And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel hard by the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth saying, Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs because it is near unto my house and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it or if it seem good to thee I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel his wife came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I speak unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Thank you. Oh, I can do a three-hour teaching on these passages. 
there are so many secrets hidden there vineyard is compared to the kingdom of god and vineyard is also a, a, a symbolic utterance to the church so if we only i mean this is out of context i'm going out of context i'm going into ecclesiology slightly naboth had a church and ahab wanted naboth to give him the church so that he can translate that church into a pub right and naboth says no this i inherited from my fathers people like john wesley charles wesley george whitefield whitefield smith smith wigglesworth people uh, 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 of those yester years yester uh, centuries who toiled and brought these churches to existence like john knox of scotland you know i inherited the church from my forefathers i am not going to lose it for you you worldly king for you to run a dancing pub a club here and then he goes he says i instead i will give you another church another vineyard another small one i'll i'll give you one in glasgow you know in the city right i'll i'll, I'll give you a better one and then naboth says no and then this king goes home and he tells the story to jezebel and jezebel says i will give you that church so jezebel doesn't own it to give right if at all jezebel said what she said she should have said i will get it for you but here jezebel says i will give it to you can you see jezebel now tell me the way i told it didn't that happen in your country hasn't that happened in your country england dave hasn't that happened but now let's go back to jezebel i think you understand what i'm trying to say let's go back to jezebel's story the ninth thing that the jezebel does is bringing acting into one's life acting ahab lusts after the vineyard of naboth then he goes and asks naboth hey i want the vineyard i will give you another vineyard and then Naboth says no I won't give you. So Ahab because he was the king and he was an evil one already. He could have confiscated the vineyard or perhaps gotten it by force and and given some money for it or something. He could have after all he was the king. He did not act as the king there but he came home like a small child after being hurt by another child when playing outside and he he says when food is given him he says i'm not going to eat i don't want bread and then he goes and he acts like a woman by jumping onto the bed and sobbing you don't expect men to jump on the bed and cry for anything so he is now this masculinity is now replaced by a false femininity and that is why i'm saying it's acting and he is going and sobbing now jezebel comes and jezebel says honey what's wrong with you hun is there a problem and he sits up and says, hey, what jezebel i i went to nabot and and and, and nabot i had a vineyard and i want that vineyard and i i i asked him i even said i'll give another vineyard but he said i won't give me can you see that when 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 one gets associated with jezebel that person that church that society that home becomes an acting place you won't find reality there anymore you will find something else on the surface and something else on the inside jezebel infected people will show all the love and kindness to you but on the inside they are different and because you are so familiar with such 
love and kindness and stuff poured onto you, when you go to a real true church, things are going to offend you. So you are going to keep away from those offenders. And the next time you see somebody, so the preachers, the Jezebelian preachers will act when they get up there to preach. They will just pour the, the nice smelling ointments on you through sermons. And you are happy and happy. And the first time you see somebody who are real, who is real, who is nothing but real, you'll be offended, hurt, damaged. You don't want to do anything with them. Every time you hear prophecies, it's about good things in the church. You don't need prophecies if you have. Well, I, I'm, I'm for prophecies, okay? <laughs> I am for prophecies. Praise God. But you don't need prophecies if you have the word of God fully in you. Yeah. Because that is prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. Any prophecy coming to you should be substantiated by the word of God. Yeah. But you're so used to prophecies saying, you can go and live in sin and come, but God is going to bless you. You know, you can go and mess with everything and you come and God is your shepherd. You shall be not in want. And the first time you hear a real prophecy from the word, you are offended. The word offends you. So, Jezebel is now telling Ahab, hey, you are a king. Come on. She should have said something like this. Jezebel should have said something like this. You are a king, aren't you? You are a man, aren't you? So why don't you go and get it? Simple as that. But she says, you are a king, aren't you? You are a man, aren't you? So don't cry. I will get it to you. Come on. Jezebel is abstractly showing Ahab her greatness over his kingship. So you remain the king Ahab. Don't behave like a little child Ahab. You get up Ahab. You be the man Ahab. But I will do the rest. Can you see? Can you see the subtlety of Jezebel? Acting. Jezebel is also acting there. So you will find that acting. And within that acting is self-apathy, self-pity. Ahab is feeling sorry for himself. The spirit of Jezebel will cause people to feel sorry about themselves. When they are infected by Jezebel's spirit, they would then come and say, Oh, I don't have anybody. I don't have friends. I don't have parents. I don't have anything. I am a poor, innocent creature. Have you seen these kind of people? Self-pity. Always self-pity. Me, me, me. Poor me, poor me, poor me. Oh. That's Jezebel. If they are Christians, they should be able to say what Paul said. I was crucified with Christ, yet I live, but it's not me anymore, it's Christ who lives in me. And Christ never says, poor me, they crucified me, look at me, they have crowned me with thorny crowns. He didn't say that when, it, when that happened to him. He was crowned. With thorny crowns, he didn't mourn. <coughs> he is victorious. He rose again from the dead. And Jezebel wants to come and make, bring that self-apathy and self-pity. Acting. Poor me, I don't have. Then the other thing is, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have thing. It's a syndrome, I would say. 
Well, who doesn't have needs? Tell me. I have needs. You have needs. Just because I am from Sri Lanka doesn't mean that I have greater needs than those of you who live in Scotland and England. Just because I am brown and you are white doesn't mean that I have more needs than you. Right? Just because I am brown and you are white doesn't mean that you have more money than me. Maybe your monetary value is more than the monetary value of my currency. But your God is my God and my God is your God and all our money belong to Him. Amen. It's distributed in the way it is. So I don't need to be sorry that I have a less value currency and you don't need to be proud because you have a greater uh, valued currency. It's relative, isn't it? In your country, you, you earn so much because you spend uh, for that much. But the problem is, many Asian, African people, pastors from poor countries, always lament and lament and lament saying, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have, my church doesn't have, my church doesn't have. We need, we need, we need, we need Jezebel. Only if I had Naboth's vineyard. <laughs> Only if I had some Scottish money. Only if I had some sterling pounds. <laughs> Am I getting somewhere here? So, now that doesn't mean to say that we don't have needs. You can help me and bless me. I can help you and bless you. That's different. But based on the needs, the Jezebel will make some people become self pity pitiful and self apathetic number 10 false authority if you read further come on come on up <laughs> can you find that verse where it says that she wrote a letter and she put yeah, yeah. come on read it um so she uh, this is from verse 8 so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles okay. that were Thank in you. the city. She wrote the letters and she put Ahab's sign on it. False authority. <laughs> what I'm going to say to you is going to surprise you. Can I hold that Bible for a second? This is the authority. The Bible is the authority. And many denominations, many churches have now got many authoritative documents with which they run their churches. Authoritative creeds, authoritative documents. Authority is the Bible. And any other authority is false authority. God gives authority to people, but that authority is supported by the biblical authority. If I'm a pastor, I am to uh, uh, exercise my authority as a pastor. But my authority comes from the Bible. It's the biblical authority. It's not the authority which comes with my position. It's not the authority which comes from my denomination. Jezebel used false authority. She wrote... She wrote like Ahab with the knowledge of Ahab, by the way. So, exercising false authority is equal to allowing people exercise false authority. There again. Ahab was equally, as equally guilty as Jezebel for permitting her to do what she did. And if you are in a church, I don't know where your church is. If you are in a church which is not exercising the biblical authority but some authority written by some people, you are as guilty as them. Yeah. Serious. Because you are Ahab's, they are Jezebel's. Ahab was equally guilty. Then 11. False testimony. Let's not read it. I'll, I'll just tell you the story. You know what she wrote? She said, she wrote to the elders saying, now you set up a witness, a couple of witnesses to 
come and say that Naboth said these things. That would mean his death. So she made people lie and false testimony was given and through that false testimony Naboth was killed. He was stoned and his vineyard was taken. So Jezebel kept, kept her promise in getting, not getting, but giving that vineyard to Ahab through false testimony. Jezebel gives false testimony. Lies, lies. You're not telling lies. Many people say, oh, it didn't come from my heart. It came from my lips. Isaiah 59 says that the, ha the hand of the Lord has not gone short, lest he should help. You know, something like that. Yes. Do you know that was by heart? The Lord is not short, I cannot see. Yes. And his ear, is not heavy, that I cannot hear. his ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. But, he says, you have lies on your lips. So lies in your heart is not serious, not only serious, lies on your lips. You know, sometimes you say, oh, I didn't really mean it. Lies is very evil. Because no sin has a dad, but lies does. Devil is the father of lies. So false testimony. You know, thou shalt not utter false testimony against another is one of the commandments. So Jezebel makes people utter lies, li false preaching, false teaching, false Christianity, lies, you know, false prophecies, everything. Finally, this is very, very, very serious. <coughs> killing the Christian. Naboth was finally killed. Why was Naboth killed? Only because he had a vineyard. Not because of anything. Jezebel wants to destroy Christians because they belong to the vineyard of God. The ultimate goal of Jezebel and all these that we studied is to destroy the Christian in order to steal the vineyard which is the kingdom of God. The vineyard is the kingdom of God, isn't it? Jezebel wants to steal it. Jezebel, being the superior, most satanic spirit, wanted to get God's glory when he was still up there in heaven as an angel. But God threw him down from heaven and he has not yet given up. He's still trying that and the spirit of Jezebel has one ultimate goal and that is to steal the vineyard. And to steal the vineyard... He has to steal the churches. To steal the churches, he has to steal the people in the churches. To steal the people in the churches, he has to steal the families and individuals. And that is what Jezebel's goal is. And if you look at the history, you would see that there have been times when Jezebel succeeded in stealing the entire vineyard. In 325 AD with the coming of Constantine. Many Christians think that that was a glorious epoch. No. If they let the church alone, it would have survived as a glorious institution. But that time, Jezebel stole it. Only to lose it to people like Martin Luther, Zwingli. John Calvin, John Knox and the so powerful people of the Reformation era. But now Jezebel has succeeded in stealing the reformed churches. Yeah. Jezebel has stolen them again. Yeah. Evangelicalism was born and Jezebel has stolen it to a great extent. Pentecostalism was born in the, with the dawn of the 20th century and Jezebel could even steal that. And today, there's hardly a church left without Jezebelian influence. And if you look down on earth from up, you would see pockets of churches and Christians 
still unpolluted by Jezebel. I wish you are part of that and you are part of that. If not, come out of that Jezebelian stuff and be that pure church, the pure bride Paul wants to present to his master when he comes. I'm not going to go over this because you, you know and the DVDs and the recordings are there. You can rewind and see. But I believe God has given you a, a great insight onto Jezebel and his schemes. Now don't be deceived. But let me tell you something. We are the conquerors. We are more than conquerors. It may seem that Jezebel has won. But Jezebel did not win. Ten years after the death of Ahab, Jezebel survived as a queen. But then her demise came in a very gruesome manner when she was thrown down from the wall and she fell and she was scattered and the dogs licked her blood and the horses ran over her and the prophecies came. And Jezebel's doom is that. Jezebel is already a defeated foe. Yeah. Jezebel has not won the victory. We are the more than conquerors. It is because people are so foolish that they allow Jezebel to come into their lives, homes, churches and societies. So my dear brothers and sisters and those of you who are watching, just know that Jezebel is not something that we have to be afraid of, but we have to be careful of. Because it is not dangerous, it's filthy. We, we, do, we don't need to be afraid of Jezebel. We need to, be, we need to, to feel sordid about it. Yeah, key feeling about Jezebel. And therefore keep out of Jezebel. May God bless you and let me close with this prayer. Shall we all pray? Father, I commit all these people who have heard this message into your precious hands. Let them know that they are all bought with a wonderful price. The price which is the blood of Jesus Christ. And although you purchased us, Lord, as slaves, you are not treating us as slaves, for we are sons of God and the bride of Christ. So, Lord, as more than conquerors, I pray that you would continue to enable us to walk as victorious people on this earth till you, Lord, come and take the church unto yourself. And we want to proclaim that Jezebel, Antichrist, death and hell, and all his forces down on earth, the principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, are all defeated in the name of Jesus. So Lord, I pray for all these people who have heard this, who have seen this, bless them, and equip them to demonstrate the victory that the church has received over Jezebel. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Suresh. Bless you. This has been the most powerful week of meetings here in Scotland. We give Jesus all the praise and all the glory for this message to go out to cover the expenses of this.